Well, this morning we're going to look at some words of Jesus as contained in the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. And these are pretty potent words that, that Jesus speaks. But it speaks, he speaks to the reality of evil. To the reality of, of evil. And so in John chapter 8, as Jesus is addressing uh, a group of folks, he says to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's pretty potent, isn't it? You know, in Scripture, seven books of the Old Testament refer to the existence in some form or another of Satan. Jesus spoke about his reality, his realness, on multiple occasions. John chapter 8 happens to be just, just one of them. And every writer in the New Testament uh, believed in his existence. And I know this is something that is not a common theme of mine to, uh, to preach on, but uh, I think these words of Jesus can, can speak to us this morning, and I want to look here in just a moment at a passage of Scripture in Genesis chapter 3. In our own culture, we kind of have really weird ideas about, uh, about Satan. This past week, some of you may have noted that uh, the great actor Max von Sydow uh, passed away. He was, I think, well into his 80s, had a film career that spanned about 50 or 60 years. To most American audiences, uh, he was probably best known for playing the priest in the early 1970s movie, The Exorcist, right? And, uh, I don't know how many of you have ever seen that movie. Don't rush out and try to try to watch it. it. You know, you would probably have sleepless nights and all of that kind of stuff. I remember when my boys were little, David hadn't even been born yet. I think Andrew was about three, John about four. Katie was going out one night and she entrusted them to my care. She entrusted them uh, to the care of husband slash dad. And of course, uh, like happens with many wives and moms, uh, you know, she, she left the house somewhat with fear and trembling as to what might happen. So anyway, she comes back later that night, the boys are in bed, she says, well, how did everything go? I said, honey, it went great. I said, uh, the boys, now we pop some popcorn and watch The Exorcist. She did not find that funny at all. Not, not find that funny. Well, we have this kind of Hollywood version, this kind of hyped up Hollywood, quote unquote, exorcist kind of version of, uh, of Satan. And then to the other extreme, we have this kind of just caricature. He's a Halloween costume, red face with pitchfork, orchid tail, all of that kind of thing. But you know, scripture reminds us that evil is real. Evil is real. And, uh, and so I just kind of want us to take stock of that a little bit this morning. Uh, Warren Wearsby, in, uh, in many of his studies, talks about how that evil comes at us as believers. That he is the deceiver who attacks our minds with lies. He is the accuser who attacks our spirits with accusations. He is the destroyer who attacks our will with pride. In the Hebrew language, uh, the kind of description of uh, Satan was the accuser. In the Greek, in the New Testament, it is the corrupter. And so, of course, both are obviously uh, in play. But I want us to look at what happens 
in Genesis chapter 3 because this just reminds us of one of the ways that evil comes at us as believers. And it's that scene there in the garden where the serpent comes and approaches Eve. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, Now she's going to quote God. She's going to quote God. We're going to look at this in just a second. You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. End of quote. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Well, what I want us to do is to drill into what happens here in Genesis chapter 3, because we see how easy deception can slip into our lives. And um, and we see that it happened so strategically here with both Eve and Adam in this, in this narrative uh, back in Genesis. And so the first thing that we know is the serpent's question to Eve, did God really say? Did God really say? He questions God's word. And that's the very opening salvo of how deception can creep into our life. He questions God's word. And I want to suggest to you, this isn't in your worship guide, but there are three kind of sequences here that happen that are ever so sly, ever so strategic as, as the serpent plants this deception within the spirit of both Eve and Adam. First thing that is implied, step number one, is that God is not good enough. God is not good enough. Because what the serpent does, the serpent comes along to Eve and basically says, did God really say that you could not eat from that tree there in, in the middle of the garden? Now, I want you to think for just a moment, in this in this creation narrative in Genesis, God has given to them everything. God has given to them everything they could possibly need, everything they could possibly desire. We have in this creation narrative that, that all is in perfect balance, and so God has, has given them everything, but notice that the serpent diverts Eve's attention from the everythingness of God to what she cannot have. And by implication, he is strategically suggesting and planting the seed in Eve's spirit. You know what? God's not good enough because he is withholding what's in the middle of the garden. And when you and I begin to think that way, we are on the slippery slope to believing something that is absolutely not true. And so that's step number one. You know what? God's not good enough because he has withheld that thing from you. Step number two, God enjoys the best. Gee, why isn't he letting you? And so the serpent reminds Eve, well, you know what? God knows this secret knowledge. God knows the difference between good and evil. Well, why isn't he sharing that goodness with you? Why isn't he giving to you? 
do what he has. You see how this is progressing? And then step number three is goodness can be obtained without God. And so the serpent tempts Eve to go and to go ahead and eat of the fruit because, right, she's not going to die. There's going to be no real consequence to this. You can have everything that is present here for you and in front of you. You can have all the goodness and the abundance that's out there without God. And so how sly and strategic the serpent was in kind of seducing Eve and Adam into that deception. You know what? That sequence of beliefs happens today. It happens today. There are a lot of folks that live with the belief and even some folks within the church who live with the belief, you know what, I can have the best of life without God. I can have the good things and the abundance of life without God. Well, that's no different from the position that Eve is in and Adam is in by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3 and the outcome here of this, of this conversation. Or if we believe that, you know, God has withheld His best from us. If God has withheld His best from us. And so those seeds of deception begin to get planted within us. Notice how Eve responds to the serpent's question. And so we've seen how she has quoted God, but let's listen to what God really said. This is what God said back in Genesis 2. You are free. You know what? We can stop right there. We can stop right there. There's verse 3. You are free. And one of the ways that they are free is... They can eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for what, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now that's what God said. That was his command in Genesis chapter 2. Is that what Eve quoted <coughs> in Genesis 3? She did not quote God correctly, did she? Nowhere in what Eve said, God said, is there ever the word free mentioned? Eve never says the word free. Eve never says freely given. None of that is a part of Eve's response. None of that is a part of how she represents what God said in responding to the serpent's question. And there's something else that Eve does in quoting God. She says that God said that you weren't even, not only were you not to eat of the fruit of the tree or you would die, she said, God said, if you touch the tree, you will die. God never said that. God never said that in Genesis chapter 2. And so what Eve has done here is she has diminished the positive of God's command and exaggerated the negative of God's command. She has diminished the positive and exaggerated the negative. Aren't you glad we never do that? Right? How many times do we do that? Keep going, David. Keep coming, brother. One more slide. There you go. All right. Yeah, you forgot the clicker this morning, and so David's up there doing slides today. You're doing good. You know, we can do that in our life too. We can diminish the positive of God 
and exaggerate what we perceive to be the negatives. You know, there are a lot of people uh, outside the church that think that when you come here, all you're ever going to hear from me is hellfire and brimstone. All you're going to hear from me is all the, the kind of heavy, quote-unquote, negative stuff. And what were we talking about last week? Come and joy and love and grace. A lot of folks in the world just love to hype what they consider to be the negatives about faith and the negatives about God and diminish the positive. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my mom would, uh, about every other Saturday, thank goodness we didn't do it every week, but about every other Saturday she would announce after breakfast to my sister and I that we were going to clean our rooms that day. And, uh, and so, you know, that meant sometime be between breakfast and lunch, uh, Susie, my sister, had to clean her bedroom and I had to clean my bedroom. And, and so um, I would go upstairs and I'd take the, you know, the pledge and the dust rag and, and I'd do a, a swipe, maybe, maybe two swipes across the top of the dresser and there was a little headboard on the bed and I'd kind of, you know, run it down there and, and uh, that was it for dusting. And then uh, for the vacuum cleaner, uh, I'd take it and, and do about three or four back and forth right in the middle of the bedroom, and then I'd tell mom, room is clean. Room is clean. And so my mom, she'd come upstairs, and uh, of course Susie being the perfect child. <laughs> you know, she, she was doing it, you know. Washing windows on the outside. It was just unbelievable the way she cleaned that bedroom. But I was done. I was going to give her 10 minutes. And so mom would come up, and she would always have to sit there, are you sure you've cleaned your room? I said, oh, yes, yeah, the room is clean. And we had electric baseboard heat. And so the very first thing she would do, I don't know why I never caught on to this, but the very first thing she would do is she'd get at the end, she'd bend down, she'd get at the end of that electric baseboard heater, and she'd run her finger down the whole length of it. And it'd come out with a beautiful shade of gray on the top tip of the she goes, you have to clean this room, young man. And because I had claimed to clean it, and I really hadn't claimed it, she knew I had claimed something that was not true, then she would then make me have to clean with her the rest of the house. Now, when I would see my friends, and I would relate that experience to them, according to me, I had by myself for like three days been forced to clean the entirety of 2518 Laburnum Avenue, all the bathrooms, the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, my sister's room, she didn't even clean her room. I had was forced to clean her room. And how awful it was, and of course, you know, I probably made some claim like the only reason my parents had me was so that I could just be their little serf and clean the house. You know, I didn't really say to my friends, you know what, they've provided me a house. You know, I've got my own bedroom. We always have food to eat. I got clothes in my dresser. You with me? Man, I just hyped all the negative, diminished all the positive, and away I went. You know what? That can happen to us when we begin to think about the things of God. When you and I get in the mindset of not what has God provided for me, but what is it that I think I deserve? We diminish the positive and hide the negative. When we fail to understand the abundance of the love and the grace and the joy that are ours as a result of God's initiative in Jesus Christ, and we begin to think about all the, the, the prayers that we think God hasn't answered, all the needs we think He hasn't met, all of the things that we should have been provided, we're no better off than what's happening here in Genesis chapter 3. The deception has gone deep at that point. And so, 
when Eve begins to question the goodness of God, it makes it so much easier than to question the will of God. And that is true for you and for me. And so thus, when the serpent says to Eve, oh come on, you can eat of that tree, you're not going to die. You're just going to get the same good thing that God himself is enjoying. This secret knowledge. And so once she has begun to question the goodness of God, she now can more easily question the will of God. And that deception can come at us in a myriad of ways. That once we begin to question His goodness, we can then easily question His will and His purpose and His desires for our lives. Note the serpent's response to Eve's response. You will uh, certainly die basically at the end of, the, end of this sequence. He has completely twisted God's word to say something entirely different from what God had really said. What's the antidote to this? You know, if you and I had looked at the entirety of John chapter 8, Jesus says something else in John chapter 8 to the same group of people about really what it means to be free, about really what it means to live lives not buying into or believing in these deceptions, but into the reality of God. Jesus says this, do my commands, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And you know, sometimes, and you've heard me say this before, particularly at academic institutions, they'll have that maybe written engraved on the entrance to a library. And I'm, I'm, I love libraries, don't get me wrong. But the knowledge that Jesus was talking about, the truth that Jesus was talking about, was the knowledge of God, the truth that he himself embodied. That is what sets us free. That is what liberates us from the deceiver when he comes at us speaking his native language. Let's pray our Heavenly Father, the slope is so slippery and the deception is so sly. And Lord, we say to you confessionally this morning that sometimes in our own thinking we're not that far removed from where Eve and Adam were here in Genesis 3. As soon as we begin to question your goodness, it becomes so easier than to question your will and your purpose. Lord, when we begin to diminish all of the abundance, all of the blessing that you bring to us in life and in our minds begin to exaggerate what we perceive to be, what is not, but what we perceive to be the negatives. Then the deception has taken root. And so, Lord, may we be reminded of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we have ears that can hear not the native language of the deceiver, but the loving words of our Lord and our Savior. And that in knowing you and in surrendered obedience to you, we are set free to know life and to live life and to know it in abundance. So, Lord, may that be true for each and every one of us as we desire to know you more, to move deeper into our faith and into our relationship with you so that deception has no residence in our spirits. In Jesus' name, the Lord of life, we pray. Amen.